and now Mr. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Happy Independence Anniversary. Good morning once again, and happy Independence Anniversary. I'd like to thank the Economic Department and the One Ghana Movement for inviting me to deliver this talk. And on such a, a memorable occasion, I can think of a great many people, some of them here with us, who would have been better suited than I to be standing here in my stead. One of them is staring me right in my face, a uh, distinguished uh, vice president to be. So I'm deeply honored. Now, as I drove here this morning, I have to say I had reminiscences of my early years here, where I, like a great many of my peers, acquired the foundations of my university training. I felt especially nostalgic as I drove past Minister Saba Hall, where I spent a delightful four years as a pioneering hall residence. I think we were the first lot in that new hall at the time. It was a life of real privilege. Those days, um, we were one to a room. We had stewards actually turn our beds in the morning, clean our rooms, and um, stu uh, stewards who um, also served our meals in ornate dining halls, clad in um, white uniforms, usually starched and beautifully ironed. It was a life of privilege. And as I approached the lecture venue, this is agreeable surroundings, I felt a certain longing for the, I was selling for the text in Indigo, a certain longing for the grassy and uncluttered ambience of the old BAM library where again, um, I spent many nights. Not because it was such a great place to study, it was. But more because it offered a, a rather discreet alternative for rendezvous um, than the Walter Hall Porter's Lodge, if you know what I mean. It took me a few days to settle on my lecture topic. I sort of dilly dallied until my obstreperous nephew, Senor, um, more or less came and read me the riot act and said hey, it was time to decide. And so I did. The state of our nation's economy and politics at 65, and the path to sustainable development and democratic consolidation. All were chosen advisedly. A little wordy, perhaps, but I thought that at least in its broad sweep, it sort of captured all the issues 
on which the public's attention has been riveted, at least for the past few months, especially in the past few months. A few of my friends called me as soon as they read the flyers announcing my lecture and sort of cautioned me to be careful and circumspect. about whatever I was going to be saying today. Because this is really true. Because in their words, these people are vindictive and would come after you if you criticize them, they said. I was quite dismayed and wondered if this was truly reflective of the public sentiment in our time, or whether these friends had perhaps missed His Excellency the President's exhortation to us in his inaugural address in January 2017 to be citizens, not spectators which exhortation I was certain that he meant in earnest, knowing the president as I do. So I came undeterred. Now, as I prepared my notes for this event, I recalled that I read a book published in 1704, just at the turn of the century, of the 18th century, by a William Bosman, a merchant then in the service of the Dutch West Indian Company. He was very active in the Western region, which carried a detailed description of what he called the country of Axim. It is a book, by the way, which remained the most authoritative description of the area, which included, included the Gold Coast, for well over a century. I was so struck by his description of the village of Butre, near Princess Town, as beautiful he described the village as beautiful and marked by three shaded roads and paths. I was so fascinated that I actually, with a colleague, drove to the village just to see what it looked like today. I came back with a nagging feeling that William Bosman's account may very well not be an apt description of the area, nor indeed of many villages across the country, including my own city, Aguna Asafo, at least aesthetically. And this more than three centuries on. It is a testament both to our painfully slow rate of development as well as its urban rural disparities. Now, none of us say, of course, as we do sometimes in our frustration, that we have not made any progress since independence. Of course, we have a lot of it. To deny this is to do a great disservice to our workers, farmers, and our burgeoning middle class whose 
toil, labor, creativity, and enterprise. Through these years, have brought us where we are today and helped advance the common good. We have grown our GDP significantly. Even if in fits and starts. Even our Human Development Index, our HDI, has seen some improvement, climbing from about 0 0.43 in 1980 to 0 0.611 points in 2020. Although yet again, it is so lower than the world average in that year, based on 185 countries. So we boast about every little addition to our GDP, especially economists. Even when that growth is primarily driven by just good rains and crude oil exports. We do the victory lap and flaunt our tails when we are adjudged the fastest growing economy in the world. It is easy to get lost in the numbers and to forget, as a famous economist once said, growth in GDP per capita can encourage us to think that all is well when it isn't. We've come a very long way in our development journey as a nation since independence. But behind all the sound and fury, behind all the boasts and taunts, the claims and counterclaims, claims by the way which are not borne out by the facts of who is a better manager of the economy than who. We clearly have not succeeded in liberating our full potential as a nation. The countries with whom we started the development race and with whom we are often compared, understandably, because we started from about the same levels of GDP per capita, talking about Korea especially, with whom, as you all know, we've been compared time and again. Some of these countries that we started the journey with are now knocking on the doors of the first world, the countries of high income status while we desperately cling to the lower rungs of middle income, which is where we are. Indeed, at the average rate at which we have been growing, it is well nigh certain that we would not have moved the bulk of our poor out of poverty in another generation, quite possibly of more. At the rate we are growing, and I don't deny that we are, it is clear, studies say, that we would not have moved the bulk of our poor out of poverty in another generation, about 30 years, so perhaps more. So now, 
Where are we? I'm keenly aware that even this question is deeply political, which is why there is constant relentless disputation and controversy even over the facts of our economic performance. As we speak, all the signs point to a country in some distress, in some economic distress. The exchange rate at the forex bureaus is nearing eight CDs to the dollar. Fuel prices at the filling stations have crossed the eight CD per liter bar. Inflation is back in double digits, nearing about 15%. The government is struggling to raise money locally and is accumulating arrears to several programs, roads, school feeding, and even LEAP, even salaries. There is ongoing capital flight. And, in foreign, and foreign investors have withdrawn close to $200 million in January alone. It is absolutely not the end of the world. Not quiet. But we are not exactly sitting pretty. And it is not helpful in these circumstances to be told that we've never had it so good. Now, central to the growing economic distress that we face is the fact that we are no longer seen as credit worthy. That our policies are not seen as credible in the eyes of the investor community and of the credit rating agencies. Now, when money is borrowed, fiscal discipline means that we put our public finances in a position to be able to service our debt while still providing finances for programmed public services. Now, when servicing our debt can only be done at the expense of delivering public services especially to the poor and vulnerable, then we are in trouble. This is the predicament that we find ourselves in today. The issue really is not whether we go to the International Monetary Fund or not. That is a red herring, a very savory one, perhaps, but still a red herring. We are, yes, a sovereign nation and a proud one at that, and can, can decide not to sit 
seek IMF program support. The International Monetary Fund, the IMF, with all its power and leverage, can simply not force a program on us or on any country. An important lesson, however, of modern finance, as we all know, something we sort of learn at our mother's knee, so to speak, is that borrowed money comes always with strings attached. There is no such money. There is no such thing as free money with absolutely no conditionality. Except perhaps things like what is doled out by the same International Monetary Fund for emergencies, COVID relief, which we have obtained. And the basic conditionality for any creditor is fiscal discipline. Regardless of whether the money comes from taxpayers, from banks, from international capital markets, or from the financial institutions, our sovereignty comes with the right to manage or mismanage our economy the way we please. I agree entirely with the principle of national ownership of development policy. But we must know, of course, that we would reap the whirlwind if we should falter on account of our own policy choices or of exogenous factors such as a bewildering pandemic or both. Now, let me highlight four matters regarding the solutions for restoring macroeconomic stability and with it, the nation's credit worthiness. First, it is idle to pretend that we can address our economic difficulties without some hardship. In the short term, no one can. No one. There is simply no silver bullet or magical solution somewhere that can bring lasting relief without some level of pain and sacrifice. The real question is how we distribute this hardship in an equitable and transparent manner. So, for example, it is egregiously inequitable to have grants for about 1.5 million beneficiaries of the Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty Leave program unpaid for months. because we are in a crisis. That is not where the hardship should hit. It is the last place that the hardship should hit. Second, the problem with our public finances is structural and would require a thorough review of all rigidities, the rigidities and sources of pressure in the budget, including every flagship program 
and its sustainability and its impact. All the options must be on the table. The situation we find ourselves in calls for no less. It is important to realize that the problem is as much about raising more tax revenue as it is, perhaps even more importantly, about streamlining our public expenditure. We must not, for instance, transition temporary spending incurred during the pandemic into permanent public spending when we are already struggling to collect revenues. This would be a major policy blunder. Thirdly, we must resist the lure of solutions that would further mortgage the future of the young generations to come, such as collateralizing public revenue streams. As, Bundland, as the Bundland Commission said years ago, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Above all, we must resist well solutions. We must resist solutions that will delay hard decisions till say 2024, such as issuing zero coupon bonds ready to mature in 2025. It is something we must resist. These are not real solutions. So for example, whoever takes the reins of government in 2025 will have to sell Shell a whopping 1.5 billion in Eurobond principal payments within months of assuming office. Whoever wins the reins of power in 2025 will have to find a whopping 1.5 billion to service Eurobond principal payments just within months of taking office. So now, if we don't rebuild, there's nothing political about that. That's just a fact. <laughs> if we don't rebuild the sinking fund, and if we are unable to access international capital markets to refinance our euro bonds, then this could mean that the next government or, or administration may very well default on its maturing eurobond obligations in 2025. The national interest demands that we strive to avoid such an outcome. Again, not politics just plain good sense and patriotism on my part. My final point in this regard is that the country needs to build consensus around the reforms that are necessary to restore the nation's credit worthiness. We need not only fiscal space that we all more or less acknowledge.
but also, even more importantly, political space to enable governments to take the often difficult decisions that need to be taken to address difficult economic problems without looking over their shoulders. But that takes dialogue and respect for everybody's views. We've been here before. William, in his introduction, talked a bit about what, where we were in 1983. When it comes to the chain read, we all very much sound as though we're yearning for a return of the fixed exchange rate, stable. You announce it and you keep it there, regardless of what the markets would be doing. We've been there before. We kept the exchange rate of the CD pegged at 2.75 CDs, those of you who are old enough to remember it, at a dollar. For, for years, years, from roughly about August 78, 1978, to April 83, the resultant appreciation of the real effective exchange rate, talking about the real effective exchange rate at the time, reach something like 445%. We fixed the exchange rate at 2.75. Although we knew that nobody in his right mind was taking his dollars to the bank to get 2.75. Not when right behind the central bank. You could get it for 10. Yet we kept it there with disastrous consequences for the entire economy as successive governments failed to take corrective action, corrective and resolute action, fearing political consequences. But we read the whirlwind. As William reminded us, GDP growth just about ceased and then turned negative. And real per capita income fell by over 30%. I know what it did. It cost about one million of our people, mostly from our educated labor force, to flee the country to neighboring countries, mainly Nigeria, in search of greener pastures. Inflation rates at about 116%. It's mind-boggling, you can't imagine it now. Thanks to the huge deficits that we were, we, we'd been financing, essentially through money printing. There were shortages of basic goods, food, thanks again to two successive droughts, 75 to 77, and 81 to 83, which had destroyed a substantial acreage of our food and cash crops. University lecturers, and I speak from personal experience, who travel to Lomi over weekends, sometimes weekdays, depending upon the severity of your pain, who travel to Lomi to buy the basic necessaries of life, milk, 
soap, toilet paper, and the like. And people were grateful to travel upstanding in articulated trucks to travel long distances across the country because our transportation system had broken down. With their color bones, these people traveling in the trucks, with their color bones exposed by emaciation from having little to eat. Rolling chains, we call them, in our characteristic Ghanaian humor. We owed external payments arrears of upwards of $500 million. You'll save you some at the time. It still is today. Borrowing from anybody, least of all the capital markets, was simply out of the question. Borrowing from even neighboring or rich Nigeria wasn't possible. It has cut us off from our oil supplies because we owe them millions of dollars in unpaid bills. And just when we thought things couldn't possibly get worse, we suffered a sudden 10% increase in our population, which is about 10 million then. As over a million people of our a million of our compatriots who have emigrated to Nigeria mostly, and to a lesser extent, Cote d'Ivoire, were simply sent back home. When we had no food, when bushfires were raging, when we thought the world was coming to an end, a million people, a million of our compatriots, were sent back home. But we pulled back from the edge of the precipice, climbed out of the deep trough into which the nation had been plunged, and through a painful program of recovery and reconstruction, financed mainly with staggering sums of concessional money, 40 years repayment, 10 years grace, no interest except for administrative charges. Virtually interest-free credit. They helped to restore macroeconomic stability for over a decade and set up the core institutions of a modern open economy that we have today and take for granted today. All this was done, of course, at great political cost and for me, some personal sacrifice and pain. I lost my hair, a good many of my friends who would come to my house regularly berating me for doing what I was doing without offering anything in the way of alternatives. I remember my mother poor old lady, may she rest in peace, would come to my house well, almost every week. Sometimes tears in her eyes, saying, Kwesi, a human jay, Ghana for one year. Why? Because they were insulting her. She was a trader. We go to the market, 
And people actually insult her, call her Anyan, a witch, who had given birth to another terrible person like me. She would sob and say, quit the job. And I would say, of course, yeah, more you know, I'll think about it. So the crisis we faced then was unimaginable and infinitely more forbidding. But we survived. At great political cost, needless to say. But we survived as a nation. Which is why some of the discussions we are having as, uh, today on the economy leave me rather bemused. I recount this narrative here briefly just to say that it's a much longer story. So let me not bore you with the gory details. I recount it here to say that our current travails can be overcome provided we level with the people. The solution to a problem starts with recognizing that there is one. It must start with a recognition that there is a crisis. And level with the people. And wind down the hubris, the arrogance, the show of impunity that the people see in some sections of our political elite. Let me put it that way. Now, I have spoken at some length about our economic situation today and what can be done about it. I'm certain that our economic managers are hard at work and may already be reflecting on some of the sentiments that I've expressed. Now, let me now bring matters to a close by touching on two other themes that my lecture topic sort of entailed. Two areas that affect uh, the economic policy choices that we make as we seek solutions to our current crisis. Namely, continuity in planning, economic planning, development policy, and democratic consolidation. First, continuity and the role of the National Development Planning Commission. We are one of just a few countries that actually have enshrined development planning institutions like the NDPC in our constitution. But our experience with development planning has been checkered through the years. We had a notable plan in the first republic, which is a seven year plan for national reconstruction covering the period 63 to 64, from 63 to 64 to 1970. Since then, our planning experience has continued to be checkered. In 1994, the NDPC drafted a long-term plan called Vision 2020, which was meant to be implemented over 20 years, 25 years, from 1996. 2020. 
However, as a result, it was said, of administrative challenges, the plan was not published. Even so, the first medium-term plan from it, called Vision 2020, colon, the first step, was published and guided the government's development programs until 2021, 2001, I'm sorry, when it was replaced by the Ghana Poverty Reduction Strategy, GPRS, under the highly indebted poor country HIPIC initiative. Now, from there on, a number of attempts were made to produce other long-term plans, but none of them succeeded until the 40-year plan was produced under my chairmanship and the support of a brilliant group of commissioners with expertise in many areas. We had the benefit of great many consultants from the university here in its preparation. And under the leadership of Dr. Nimoy Thompson, the former Director General of the NDPC. In the course of preparing the 40-year plan, we were struck by the observations of a British journalist who in 1874 has this to say about street hawking. 1874. He said, and I quote, the principal street of Accra is an amusing sight. Some effort appears to be made to keep it clean, and the salespeople sit upon little mats and upon low stools, which are used all over the country. They line both sides of the street and expose for sale every sort of article prized by the natives and the goods being contained in wooden trays everywhere in use. 1874. Now, anybody, any one of us who's been to the central business district, anybody been there lately? Traveled be after the uh, old GNTC, then Cocoa Board and down. It's impossible. The walkways are clogged. Anybody been there? You can't walk there. They've just taken over the, 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 the curbs. So anybody who's been there will agree that the situation, at least of street hawking, has continued. And it's in fact much worse, despite the valiant efforts being made by the officials of the AMA. The 40-year plan had constitutional, legal, legislative, and popular mandates from Article 8, 87, legal in the NDPC's own enabling act, and so on. The 40-year plan was finished and submitted to government in 2017 and is still under consideration. We need to decide as a nation precisely what we wish to do with the constitutional provisions that enshrine the NDPC's role in our economic planning 
and development regime. This will ensure continuity in economic policy making, which has underpinned the experience of all successful developing countries, as well as even private institutions. I mean, in Stanford University, has a 100-year plan. My last point is on democratic consolidation. Economists, as usual, are not entirely all agreed. They are mostly agreed that the nation's economic growth and development depend on growth in its productive base, which is its capital assets, and its institutions. I've said a great deal already about matters that affect the growth of the productive base and its assets. But the surest way of consolidating our democracy is to ensure the pre preservation of the integrity, competence, independent, and independence of the key institutions of our democracy. I speak here of the Electoral Commission, the Public and Civil Service, Parliament, the judiciary, the press, and the media regulatory bodies, the land commission, and local government institutions for effective decentralized administration. Talking about the land commission, I don't know. Anybody tried to register a title to land? It takes a very long time, to put it mildly. So the agenda for democratic consolidation will not be complete without effective control of what I call the informal, informal layers of power that swirl around key elected officials and exercise sweeping powers without any checks and without any accountability. Informal layers of power. People not elected or even officially appointed to any role, but who still exercise sweeping powers without any checks because they can be held to account. Let me say, in conclusion, I, my obstreperous nephew, Senyo, told me um, late yesterday that we have two other discussions, so let me not monopolize the space. Let me say, in conclusion, that an important part of our efforts to consolidate our democracy will also require that we leech out of our public discourse, needless confrontation, vituperation, gratuitous insult, and profane attacks, some of the profanity just embarrasses me. Profane attacks on persons rather than issues, the issues they raise, tendencies that have sadly become the hallmark of a new breed of politicians who hide behind the anonymity of the electronic medium to ply their trade. We've had terrible recent examples of this. By Say Sam Jonah, Mr. Kwan Pienim, and others, who, after simply airing concerns in the most constructive possible way, were subjected for long periods to 
such indignities, personal attacks. They are a shameful blight on our democracy and free speech, which is its lifeblood. And now, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, my parting message. We are in the midst of a crisis that requires urgent resolution because before it becomes a catastrophe, it needn't become one. I'm not suggesting at all that we press the panic button. As an old guy, and a specialist in debt matters puts it panic is as infectious as yawning. But so, however, is a sense of composure, control, and cool especially when the house is burning. Let me say that again. Panic is as infectious as yawning. But so is a sense of composure and control and cool when the house is burning, or at least threatening to burn. I thank you. I think he deserves another round of applause. Thank you. Let's not panic.